Does any one of you recognize a former Swedish tennis player named Kent Carlson? Yes. At the peak of his career, he was ranked the number six player in the world. Today, that would have been an outstanding achievement by a Swedish tennis player. In his day, Kent Carlson was third in Sweden, behind Mats Wilander and Stefan Edberg. Let me say that one more time. Here's this player playing tennis. He's from Sweden, a tiny country way up in the north, with at this time about eight and a half million people living there. He's playing tennis, a highly competitive global sport. He's made it to six in the world, and he's third in Sweden. The two other Swedes ahead of him are ranked one and two in the world. There's another three Swedish players still within the top 20 of the world rankings of men's tennis. You see, in 1988, Kent Carlson played during an era that was later to be called the Swedish Tennis Wonder. Those were the days when Sweden was the number one powerhouse of men's tennis in the world. Given that Sweden is a country covered by snow and ice for much of the year, these players' performances on courts raised a number of questions. Why Sweden? Why tennis? Research discovered that the answer was not, as one might expect, dozens of academies with super-qualified coaches turning out players like a factory. Instead, the players that dominated the world rankings of men's tennis in 1988, they had grown up playing a variety of sports. And they had played a massive amount of tennis. From early morning till late night, they would play in the streets, at the local courts. They played with their friends, challenging each other, competing for every ball, playing for the love of playing tennis. And as they didn't have coaches hovering over them all the time, the way they played was somewhat unconventional. This followed in the footsteps of the highly successful five-time Wimbledon champion and six-time French Open champion Bjorn Borg. Bjorn changed the game of tennis with his, some might be old enough to remember, double-handed backhand. Being different and changing the existing paradigm is usually what it takes if you want to beat everybody else. Nowadays, big money is spent trying to develop the next generation of champions. And with increased competition comes the need to refine processes. And of course, we want to be more efficient. And hence, football academies were born or very sophisticated development programs in just about any sport where there's worldwide recognition to be gained. Do you possibly wonder, though, if this really is the best way to support athletes to be as good as they can possibly be? Or if we, by institutionalizing sport, are at best causing as much harm as we're causing good? And what if there's a link between sport becoming an institution and kids leaving? If we look at some of the best athletes in the world, they share the same passion for perfection in what they do as other successful people in many other areas. It seems to me, though, that very few of them are in it for the perks. Yes, they may like the rewards that come with success, but I think there's something deeper, something more profound that serves as the real drive. I think they're simply in love with what they do. And they want to do it better than anybody else. The great ones that I know of, they've done some crazy hours in their sport. World record holder and Olympic gold medalist Armand Duplantis, for example, he has a private pool vault set up at his house, in the backyard of his parents' house where he grew up. So just imagine the number of hours that young Armand spent there. Hockey superstar Peter Forsberg, he was said to have had his own key to the nearby hockey arena where he grew up. 
And if you look around Sweden, there's more than one ski slope named after an Olympic female alpine medal winner who would have spent most of her childhood on that slope. Wimbledon hero Bjorn Borg, he played day long and probably night long as well, given the Swedish summer months. Matches of tennis against his garage door. Sport for these people as youngsters was fun. It was self-chosen. It was without any outside pressure. And it certainly wasn't organized by adults. At least not all the time. Now, since the glory days of Swedish tennis and the celebrated dribbling of Peter Forsberg, a lot has changed. Some would say we don't see sport played in the streets anymore. Gone are the days of, remember, hockey on the tarmac or mini tennis in the uh, backyard. Here's instead the curse of video gaming, social media and binge TV watching and the very alarming reports of how little children and youth of today move and keep physically active. So, have children fallen out of love completely with sport and other creative activities? No, I don't think so. I think instead we can walk around just about any city and we can see them. They're skateboarding, they're kickbiking, they're perhaps parkouring, and they're certainly gaming. So, maybe it's just the relationship with sport that has changed. With development plans and curriculums, passion goes out the window. And instead, a whole range of problems occur. In fact, Ted's website is full of experts talking about overuse injuries in children as a result of too much of the same thing at an early age. And it's full of stories of children leaving sport. In Sweden, yes, this country way up in the north, Young people used to participate in organized sport between the age of 10 and 20. By the 1980s, that had dropped to 7 to 17. And the wise people at the time were saying that it looks like we're heading towards 3 to 13. Given the average dropout age of sport worldwide, nowadays, I think it's way too early to say that those people were wrong. So how do we bring back passion and creativity in youth sport. I've got a two-step program. Number one, let's disorganize the organized. It seems like children of today need a little bit of help getting out of the house and onto the sports field. We should give them that. But that doesn't have to mean that we need to dictate every minute and every day and tell them what to do. We should back off a little bit give them some space, allow for a bit of free play, at least in the sports where safety is not an issue. And if we want this activity to last for any length of, length of time, do you remember the tennis played from early morning to late night in the 1980s? Then we probably need to look at some incentives as well. So number two, those of you that know a thing or two about programming, this is where sport needs your passion. We've already seen some examples of how sport and technology can work together. Pokemon Go actually got people moving around the neighborhood while gaming. Many of us wear watches on our wrists that'll track our training load and keep us motivated. I think there's more though. I think there's a new tomorrow where sport and the digital world merged to become DigiSport. And I bet you programmers, you'll be able to help us make sure that that new reality is full of passion, creativity, and fun. So my message is this, let's complete each other rather than compete with one another. I think our children, as well as the rest of us, deserve that. Thank you.